Hey, it's Cognosis. It's a podcast and it's a YouTube show. It's about religious studies. It's about Gnosticism. It's about whatever I'm interested in this week that I can link in with those topics. We've got returning champion, Dr. Tony Burke. Hi, Dr. Burke. Great Hi, to see Tom. you again. Great to see you too. Yeah, we're, uh, we're talking about uh, a spe- uh, that, an academic specialty of yours. Uh, I'm sure you probably have a couple, but it's uh, New Testament Apotrica. And I don't know if I'm ever saying that right. You can correct me. But we're also talking uh, about that chat Generally, but we're also getting a little bit specific to talk about your New Testament Apophica series. I should say yours, but you are both a contributor and an editor. And it's new volume, volume three, which is called simply, is it called New Testament Apophica volume three? Uh, the subtitle is More Non-Canonical Scriptures. Yeah. Okay, so for the people at home who don't know, we got to start off with what is New Testament Apophica? Uh, well, I tend to define it as uh, non-biblical Christian literature that features tales of Jesus and his family and his immediate followers, so basically the apostles and a few others, um, but they're not included in the Bible uh, for one reason or another. Um, the main reasons are uh, either they were composed too late for inclusion in the Bible, because the Bible is essentially settled uh, late 4th, early 5th century, or um, the people who cre- uh, decided what was going to be in the Bible didn't like those particular texts. So either way, the, the, they weren't included. Um, Earlier scholars of Apocrypha tended to um, think of Apocrypha, uh, the creation of them stopping around the time of the, of the formation of the canon. Um, and then anything after that, that, that was related to, to Jesus and, and uh, his you know, small group, um, they called them hagiographa or, you know, stories of the saints. Um, the, our field now is, 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 following a different route. And we just like to be more expansive in what we call Apocrypha. And in doing so, we, we, we uh, maintain that Apocrypha have been written throughout the centuries, not just in those first three. And um, even up to today, so something like the Gospel of Jesus' Wife, that's a modern apocryphal text. So people keep writing these things all the time. And another thing we, 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 we uh, discuss is that um, when you have this much more of exp- expansive view of, of what the literature can entail, it makes it clear that um, this, this dichotomy that we often talk about is, um, as canonical texts as being orthodox and non-canonical texts as being heretical kind of breaks down because we see that, you know, after the creation of the, of the canon, there are orthodox writers who continue to write apocrypha um, for whatever reasons they feel they need to. Uh, um, uh, you know, exploits of the saints or, or, or certain new ideas or new practices or establishing churches or whatever. It's a very useful um, type of te- type of text to, to, to create and, and people uh, keep doing it all the time. The only difference is my, you know, if I write an apocryphal text and I'm in the Orthodox tradition, it's not apocrypha. But if you do it and you're not in that tradition, then it is. Uh, so it's all that, that kind of idea of heresy is in the eye of the beholder. Right. So from the specific to, or, or sorry, from the general to the specific, what is the New Testament Apophrica series and how did it come about? Um, did, you're probably familiar with, and your viewers are probably familiar with, certain uh, compendia of apocryphal texts that you can just get it in any regular bookstore. So Bart Ehrman's Lost Christianity, oh, sorry, Lost Scriptures, or J.K. Eliot's Apocryphal New Testament. So these are the collections that tend to, as I mentioned before, focus on the first three centuries. So you certain, have certain classic apocryphal texts in there, like the Gospel of Thomas or the Invincible Gospel of James and various others. Um, there was, uh, there's a similar collection of Old Testament pseudepigrapha, so Jewish apocrypha, essentially, that was put out by uh, a scholar named James Charlesworth. And it was a similar in focus. It, it sto- stopped at a particular moment in time. And an uh, 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 Old Testament pseudepigrapha scholar, James Davila, um, decided to put together a more expansive collection. But, but he didn't want to uh, cover the same text. He just wanted to c- cover new texts. So texts that haven't appeared before or had appeared before, but there's new evidence uh, which will make us establish the text better or, or new interpretations. So his volume is called More Sorry, it's called Old Testament Pseudepigrapha, More Non-Canonical Scriptures. And uh, I decided, along with Brent Landau, who helped me edit the first volume, uh, to do something similar for New Testament. So same basic idea uh, that we don't cover 
texts like the Gospel of Thomas or these other ones that are quite common because we, we just we just don't think people need that. <laughs> what we do think they need are, are texts they've never seen before or, or, or need to be dusted off and looked at anew. So that's the, that's the, that's the, 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 the approach to the basic series, um, which is somewhat exciting. New texts are always exciting. Um, the one thing that maybe takes away from a bit of the excitement is we don't cover early texts unless we get you know some new um, discovery. So the texts tend to be somewhere between the fourth century and say the 10th century rather arbitrarily um, cutting off around that time. But they all have their interesting features, um, but uh, they don't, they are not uh, another source for the historical Jesus, for example, which a lot of people like. Uh, they just are sources for various forms of Christianity throughout the ages. And you know, that's, I think that's just fine. Yeah. Can, can you tell us a little bit about this, uh, the specific new volume, about volume three? Sure. Um, well, the, just uh, one other thing to say, um, previous Apocrypha Compendia tend to be separated by genre. So they have like a, a volume on the Gospels and a volume on Acts, Apocrypha Acts and like that. Um, Jim started this um, uh, idea that you just, let's just put out a full volume once we have enough texts. So the, the three volumes that I've had so far are not separated by genre in that sense. Each of them have gospels, epistles, acts, and uh, apocalypses. And they are just what uh, we, we gather for each particular volume based on what contributors want to do. So the third volume, like the others, have these various genres of texts. It's about 30 texts in all in the whole collection by about 30 or so contributors. Um, and um, they also vary in 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 um, in how new they are, in a sense. Uh, so some texts have uh, never appeared before ever in any, in any format. Um, some have appeared as critical editions, but not tr modern translations. Some have appeared in other modern translations, but not English. And some have appeared in English, but they need to be, you know, reevaluated because of new manuscripts and, and sometimes new perspectives. So we've got that kind of range going on in there. Um, and yeah, um, there's a preview that, that one can see on my own website, which is just TonyBurke.ca, uh, which gives the, uh, the contents and uh, the, the opening introduction. So you know, readers can get a sense of what it is and hopefully in, in doing so, they will be captivated and decide to run out and buy themselves uh, a copy of their own. Fantastic. And I know you can't uh, uh, speak for every scholar contributed to the to the book, and you sort of already did cover this, but can you tell me why the, the specific texts in this book? Is it is it because these are texts that some of these scholars have been working on for a long time? It's related to their particular specialties. It grabs their imagination. They've just been discovered. All of the above. Like, what, is, Can you go into any more detail on that? It is very much a kind of all, all of the above. Um, so, so being um, connected in various ways that I am with 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 uh, scholars in the field, I have a sense of what people are interested in and what they might be working on. And once you get that first volume out, people start coming to you because mm -hmm. they they know it's an it's a it's a venue for their work. So people would would come to me and say, you know, uh, could we could we include this? I'm working on this edition, and, and I'd be happy to contribute. A translation. So, for some some extent, it's people coming to me and saying what uh, they have available. Sometimes I will go out and and solicit if so if a text that I think I would really like to see and and I can see how manageable it is for for someone to work on. I might ask someone who's kind of adjacent to that text working on something similar, and they could perhaps do something like that. So, a, one example is there's a text in the collection called. Um, uh, the dialogue of, of Mary. I can't remember the full name of it. <laughs> anyway, it's a dialogue text with Mary and, and Jesus on the Mount of Olives. Um, and um, um, we had a contributor to volume two. They did a Mary Magdalene text. And I'm sure I think she did more volume one as well. And I, I, I was interested in this text because it hadn't been printed before. I knew of its existence. I knew the sources. And I said to her, how would you like to do this text? And, and she was happy to do so because she contributed before and apparently that worked out well. And so I will sometimes ask people to do stuff. And in the, the second volume, another example of this, we had a few, uh, what we call uh, uh, Johannine Apocalyptica, Apocalypses of John. 
And um, I think we had two slated to be in there. And I thought, well, we should do them all. And there's only, I think, one more. So I had to, I actively asked someone uh, to, to do that extra one so that we could get them all in one volume. Like, again, there's no obligation to do everything within certain categories within a volume because we have, you know, another volume that could include that. But it's really nice to have them all in one so we just can see them all in one group. So that's the thing. It's, it's a matter of uh, scholars' availability, what they're working on, what, uh, what I think might be nice to include if possible. You also get the problem sometimes with people who say they'll do something and then they, they drop out. So then something is, I have to rush to figure out what can I do to fill that hole. Um, and of course, some of the texts in there uh, are ones I've worked on myself. And so they, they, they also get included because of my own interests as well. Yeah. Um, does Apothrica, 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 does it quote, and I put this in scare quotes in the, the notes that I sent you, does it quote unquote matter to people who aren't scholars or for people who are like nerds, you know, nerds like me, the, the nerds, we love you nerds who are listening and watching to the show, but you know, they're not, uh, they're not uh, students, they're not professors, uh, this is not how they're making their living. If so, why? Um, I think this, it tends to be, uh, or become interesting. Um, when something sensational happens. So when, say, the, Vin the Da Vinci Code book was published, and so people become aware of these texts, or the Gospel of Judas gets published, various things show up in the media. So people, it tends to spark people's interest again, which is great because then people start to ask me questions uh, and I feel relevant all of a sudden. Um, but of course, uh, it also means we have to spend some of our time kind of correcting the sensationalism around the, what people, what the people in the press are saying or in popular media. Um, so certainly there's that interest when that comes up and, and some people, their interest is sparked because they feel like they've uh, been lied to or manipulated or, or not told the full story. Mm -hmm. And that's how I felt when I was, when I was younger as well, when I started to become interested in these texts, I thought, well, why, why don't I know about this? Um, and so that's good. It's good when, when people get, get interested in something that, um, they'd never heard of before and want to educate themselves about it. And I think if you're you're in the Christian tradition, I think it's it's good to have as, as thick and deep a knowledge of your own tradition as possible. And all of the the the, the aspects of Christian doctrine, um, well, maybe not all, but quite a lot of them, are defined in a relation to something else. It's it's not only statements about what we are; it's about statements about what we are not. And to have that other side, the other perspectives that they're defining themselves against, I think that's very useful to have. So I'm, uh, you know, of the opinion that that the more information you have, the better. Um, particularly when it comes to groups that have been uh, silenced in history. And so let's let's hear from those particular groups. So that's when it comes to more what we call heretical texts, texts by, by groups we call Gnostics or, or other uh, groups. But there's a, a wide range of apocryphal texts that are not heretical so much, uh, but they're just not in the New Testament. And I'm just going to give one example of the, that kind of text. And this is the, the Protoevangelium of James or the Infancy Gospel of James. So this is a text many people may know about it but it's it's a harmony of the the infancy narratives of luke and matthew because they are very different from one another you know we got magi in the one hand and shepherds in the other uh birth in a cave on one hand birth in the, in the house in the other so this writer in the second century wanted to uh, harmonize these texts but also added a whole bunch of other stuff as well stuff about mary's conception and birth and her upbringing and some other things the point i want to make about this is this is so wide widely copied in the East, the Greek East, like there's hundreds of manuscripts of it, uh, and also Syriac and other languages as well. It's virtually canonical. When you see a nativity scene in Eastern Christianity, it includes a character named Salome, who is a midwife, and her story is told in the Infancy Gospel of James. So you only really understand that Christmas scene in the East if you know these traditions. Um, so the text has, it's, it's, it's not exactly apocryphal in the East, but it's not exactly canonical either. So um, you can may find that some people, some people's Christianity is wider than the canon without them actually realizing it. Another, another example you might say, I think of is like the gospel of Nicodemus. There's this Christian tradition that when, after Jesus died and the three days that he's 
not here on earth. He goes down to, to hell and liberates the, the patriarchs, all those people who never got a chance to meet Jesus. So Adam and Abraham and so on. And then they meet him and then they can achieve salvation. Not part of the Christian Bible, but very much part of the Christian tradition. So whether people know it or not, you know, that that information is part of their tradition. So I think I think it would be a good idea to be aware of where these stories come from and uh, get that sense of, of a fuller uh, history of your own tradition and outsiders. Um, like, I guess it'd be interesting to anyone who, who enjoys history and enjoys knowing where, where ideas come from and where they develop, whether you're, you know, in the Christian Christian tradition or not in the Christian tradition. I think also for, for contrarians, you just like to like to see um, um, what the church is is trying to sub, uh, trying to to censor or subvert within that tradition and um, criticize them for. And I think it's worthwhile criticizing authorities that that try to um, uh, try to get people not to read text. That's always a good indication that you should be reading a text. Yeah, there are limits, of course, um, but. But in this case, that those limits aren't broached. You know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise reading Mein Kampf, but I would advise reading uh, some apocryphal gospels. Right, right, exactly. Um, and and uh, an important point of clarification that that you mentioned in passing, but maybe if we could just dwell on it in a moment to, to clear up. I think what is a common misconception, and, and you as a as a professor who teaches, working with a lot of young people, uh, uh, maybe you've gotten this question. You know, if a text is not in the Bible, if it's an apocryphal text, it's not automatically a quote unquote Gnostic text, right? I, I find that this is a very common misconception I see online a lot. Yeah, and early scholarship in the new testament tended to follow this assumption that if something is not in, included in the bible that it is gnostic oh. and that is uh buying into what the early church writers would often say that any group that they don't like they call gnostic even if they weren't it's just a it's a pejorative term but yeah there's lots of texts that don't have gnostic ideas in them um and again, some of that early scholarship, it's, look at it now, it's a bit embarrassing in the sense that they're, they're looking so hard for the Gnostic elements in them that are simply not there. Um, so now we have a much more nuanced view of, of, of Gnostic thought, even in the sense that we, we hesitate to define Gnosticism in any clear way anymore. We see these uh, texts kind of along the spectrum where, where the writers are dipping into various ideas that are, are that are available to them and sometimes they they lean a bit more towards narcissism sometimes they lean a bit more towards orthodoxy um and that 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 spectrum you know on the 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 extreme end would be having a dualistic system with a a, a, a high invisible god and then a lower um, evil or malignant in some sense god that is the ruler of this earth and that jesus is a as an envoy from the good god to the to people below below, below here to trying to tell them about where they where their ultimate origins are. So that's the more kind of fuller Gnostic kind of thing. But then we have texts that that will 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 have some elements of that, but not all of it. Like the Gospel of Thomas is a classic, classic example of that. It certainly has a certain dualism about it, but never talks about a, a lower God, a demiurge or creator figure. Um, so we hesitate now to declare something as Gnostic or not Gnostic. But again, scholars from about 100 years ago were not as... Uh, um, uh, not as critical as in quite the same way we are today about about what the her the the early church writers what we call the heresy hunters were saying about their their opponents we're much uh, more attuned these days to realizing that sometimes people don't characterize their enemies uh in accurate ways so we need to be very careful about about uh, uh adopting those points of view and and uh believing that they are accurate yeah, absolutely. So a question that's, that's sort of similar to my, do these texts quote unquote matter? But but I hope you can, uh, I, well, to me, the, the, there's a, it, it sounds the same or similar, but but there's a subtlety here. Uh, the many ancient texts from Gilgamesh to the Psalms to the Odyssey, you know, you name it, uh, can can move people by their beauty and their power and their, their insights into the human condition, even though they can be far removed from their historical and cultural context now. And of course, we could be far removed from the theology or theologies that they espouse. Do, do you think that any of the Apotheca also have this power? 
I think some do. I think the the best case for that is something like the Gospel of Thomas, because it's got it's got it's got it's, it's kind of profound. It's mysterious. It's kind of a bit new agey. Some people like to compare it to to Buddhism, and I think and I, partly because you know they have these you know these little nuggets of sayings which which invite um, expansion and discussion, and that's you know the, the basically the uh, the point of the text. It says whoever understands the um, the um, the secrets of these sayings will have eternal life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I don't think there's anything that quite matches that text in its depth. The, the, the best I think you get when it comes to, to, uh, I guess, profound and mysterious again, is, are the range of Gnostic texts, but they're, they're difficult reading, you know, something like the Apocryphon of John, which has this elaborate cosmogony, a creation of the universe and then creation of the world. And it's got, uh, endless lists of, of angels and various aspects of God. It's difficult reading, in part because these are translations from Greek into Coptic, and then we translate them into English, and they're, they're probably not very good Coptic translations. So it can, can get quite challenging. But I think there's something about the, the, the Gnostic um, uh, myth that I think is attractive to modern people. I, I, I like its, its sense of uh, trying to grapple with loneliness, like feeling that you don't belong in this world, that there, um, um, that maybe you belong somewhere else, or maybe you haven't found your exact calling or something like that. Or the, uh, the idea that humans are in this world and we are, we are, uh, we've been made, made drunk by the world or, or um, distracted. And then we can uh, maybe liberate, liberate ourselves from these trappings uh, in some way. And, and then, you know, find our true true calling as i said before or purpose but i wish the text were easier to understand than that because you really have to work hard to boil it down to those elements and there's a there's a text called the hymn of the pearl which is part of uh, uh the acts of thomas which tells that same basic story but in a much more uh clear way and 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 uh almost fairy tale like quality and so I often begin my Gnosticism classes with that tale because it, it, it's more instantly grabbing for students, I think, to understand the basic idea of Gnosticism. So yeah, Gnostic texts, interesting ideas. Uh, I think it has a, a, a can have a connection for, for people, um, but they're difficult. So grabbing a text with, with less of those trappings is better. Now, many of the texts in, in our volumes, they, fit in with very specific historical contexts and even geographical concepts. So they'll deal with things like establishing churches. So you need a backstory, like why this church? Why, why was it here? Usually, you know, um, there's some special event that happens, like a Mary will appear or something like that and, you know, uh, um, and declare this particular place, um, her church or something along those lines. So establish churches, establish feast days, uh, discuss certain practices. Um, sometimes, again, the, the establishment of churches is connected with with pilgrimage. So, you know, what better way to get pilgrims to come to your church than to to say, well, this was built by Mary or built by Paul or whatever. Um, some are focused on monastic interests, um, which are not, you know, they're not the interests of everyday people. So very specific goals, very specific context. So they may not be as a, as uh, have a, as wide ranging an appeal as something like say the Gospel of Thomas has, if that's what you want out of a text. Um, these of course are appealing to me because I, I, I consider myself a historian. I'm interested in, in what people uh, do to play with these characters and, and use them for particular means. Um, but I wonder sometimes if, if a volume like this is going to be uh, disappointing for people who want that uh, sense of profound or, or you know, again, the search for the historical Jesus, something like that, out of these texts, which it's not going to get. But they, I think they have, I think the texts have a lot of other things in there that are very interesting. And uh, because they are new for many readers, including many scholars, each text, I think, has, has something uh, to, 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 to bring to the reader and hopefully attract them. Absolutely. So can you tell us a bit about the, the text that you worked on for the volume? You have uh, the decapitation of John the Forerunner, which yeah. I understand is not the one of John's head flying around for a year shouting at people, right? Um, and we also have the martyrdom of Zechariah, and then a third, the epistles of, of uh, uh, 
Longinus, Augustus, uh, your Sinus, and uh, Patrophilus. Yeah, they're they're a bit of a mouthful. Those ones. Um, <laughs> yep. Yeah, the uh, you mentioned the 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 text about the the flying head of John the Baptist. We did that text in the first volume, and I love that text. It's again one of the ones I I tend to start my course with. Um, because what better way than to talk about a flying head? Like, come on. Um, uh, but back, let me back up. So um, I did a, a, a an article on John, the Apocryphal John the Baptist traditions some time ago, and I focus on that particular text. That text called is called The Life of John the Baptist by Serapion. And in that process, I mentioned some other texts that hadn't been published or have been pu only published in part. And there are about uh, five of these texts that uh, were discussed about a century ago by a German scholar named Alexander Berenz. And when I'm thinking, trying to think about what, what can I include in these collections or what can I maybe work on, I try to look at stuff that hasn't been published enough. And there's a, uh, there's a book, uh, I mean, I come very close. Yeah, I think you can see that, called Clavis Apocryphorum Novi, Test Novi Testamenti. So this is a list of apocryphal texts. It's about somewhere close to 350 of them. And it lists, you know, various texts and, and where they've been published and what's not published. So if I look through something like this and I see unedited, I'm going, okay, something for me to do. So these texts were either partially published or, or not published at all. So that's where I go. So I assembled the manuscripts for, well, sorry. So of these five texts, one of them we included in one New Testament volume one, and then we've done uh, two more in this volume that I did, uh, Decapitation of John and Martyrdom of Zechariah. And those two texts are, are related. The Martyrdom of Zechariah is just a little bit longer than the, than the Decapitation. So I'm mostly gonna talk about the contents of the Martyrdom of Zechariah, just to, for expediency's sake. Um, I'm just looking at my screen here to remind me of, of, of some points. Um, Okay, so both are attributed to uh, someone named Eur Eurypius, um, who says, according to the text, is a disciple of John. So clearly this is a kind of an apocryphal text. It, it's, it's about John, things we don't know about John that, that we haven't seen before. And apparently it comes from Eurypius, the disciple. And the, the author says that he's writing, uh, because, uh, writing this text for people who want to commemorate John. So this is a, a text for, or Zechariah, uh, for the feast days of these characters. And so you often find these manuscripts uh, in compendia of, of texts read for specific feast days in the, Greek, in the Greek church. So not the average everyday person, but monks in the monasteries would, would have these things available to them. And the texts draw upon uh, what we know, so canonical stories. It has, uh, of course, the birth of John the Baptist. It has uh, the story of Herod's uh, birthday party where John gets decapitated. But then it adds in other things. So it adds in a story from the infancy gospel of James. As the very end of that text is um, the de uh, Herod's soldiers come to get John, baby John, because, you know, he's after all of the, the infant babies, um, as we find in the gospel of Matthew. And Zechariah is murdered, the father. And Elizabeth, John's mother, flees with John into the wilderness and uh, she's pursued by the soldiers and she meets up with, against this mountain. She calls on God to, for help. The mountain cracks open. She goes inside with John and closes. So and that's presumably where John remains until he's an adult and he baptizes Jesus. And so we get a restatement of that story showing again an almost canonical status for this text. And then this, uh, we have a little bit of material in between uh, the, that mountain story and the baptism of Jesus. And then we get to the uh, the story of the banquet, uh, Herod's... Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Before we get there, the, the, there's a story in the martyrdom of Zechariah 1. It's not in the decapitation story, but it is in Zechariah, where uh, John, as a child, is still in the wilderness with his mother, and uh, four archangels come to John, bring him and his mother to... Uh, Jerusalem to the temple, where apparently Zechariah's body is, is 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 hidden. And Jesus is there too, presumably as a child. I'm not sure. It's not clear. It would be a child at this point, but maybe it's like kind of a ghostly kind of a figure. And they raise Zechariah back to life just so they can baptize him. Hmm. Um, and then he goes back to sleep again. Um, presumably, it's the idea is if Zechariah is going to be a saint, then he, he has to be uh, baptized, right? 
Um, so then we get to, the, to Herod's party, and then John is decapitated and dies, and the angels come back again and bring Elizabeth and John to the temple to place John's body beside Zechariah, and then they're both hidden there in the temple. And then the text finishes with a story of the Herods, because, you know, they're horrible people, they're responsible for John's death, something bad has to happen to them. And so we get the story of of the decapitation of Herod's stepdaughter, Herodias, because she's responsible for John's decapitation, she should get decapitated too. And then Herod dies in a gruesome way, and so does his wife. And that text we find in lots of other sources, including these two John the Baptist texts and others. So it seems to have a wide dispersion as well. So certainly we want to throw that at the end of these texts. So fun text, um, tricky to work with. The manuscripts are kind of, kind of difficult to read, but we managed to put that together. Now the other text, uh, this is another weird one. Again, similar kind of a thing. It's in the, the, the Clavis book, but not completely edited, not completely published. And it's called the Epistles of Longinus, Augustus, Ursinius, and Petrophilius. Only a part of his epistles. So the Epistles of Longinus and Augustus, that's an exchange between two people. And then the other two are something else. So, but let me talk about Longinus and Augustus first. So this is an exchange. We don't know who Longinus is never really identify, but it's someone who's a contemporary of the Emperor Augustus. And Longinus has heard about these Persians, Magi, coming to uh, Palestine to bring gifts for an infant. And he's writing to Augustus saying, who's this infant? And Augustus responds that, well, I'm going to, I'll find out for you. I'm going to talk about to Herod the Great and find out. And that's really all it is. Then the next piece uh, is, what, is what we would call a testimony. And this is by Ursinius, whoever that is. We don't know who that is either. And he mentions the darkening of the sun at the crucifixion. So now we have a contemporary witness to the crucifixion event. And he says he learned about this from a letter uh, from Pilate to Tiberius. And he recounts uh, how when Tiberius heard about the death of Jesus, he dismissed Pilate because Pilate just didn't do things right and threatened death to the Jews. And we see that kind of stuff in the Pilate cycle literature that there's quite a, there's quite a lot of material there. And the last bit is, some, is something called the Dialogue of Patrophilus and Ursinius. So we have Ursinius again, but it's quite a separate piece here. And this is where Patrophilus is asking his teacher, which is Ursinius, why so many illustrious thinkers and rulers have become believers in Jesus. Now, various materials, and these were pin, printed uh, about a century ago by, by a Syriac scholar in Syria. And didn't really know what these were. And so a student of mine and I were working on them. And uh, it seems to be that they were an excerpt from a larger text. And this larger text is called the Sayings of Greek Philosophers. And the Sayings of Greek Philosophers, it's a compendium of material, some that we see elsewhere. So people like, you know, Aristotle and others. Um, but this material, these four chunks here, are the only ones that mention Jesus. And that may be why the scholar decided to excerpt them, because the rest of it's not that interesting, I suppose. And what they are, are are basically pagan testimonia to Jesus. This idea that that Jesus made such an impact on the world that uh, these illustrious figures are aware of him. And it, it makes me think when looking at this about uh, the way Canadians are with Americans. So, <laughs> okay, uh, we have a bit of an inferiority complex, right? We got this this, yeah. this uh, monolith in our basement. Um, and so whenever Canadians are mentioned on television or or uh, our, our cultural heroes, our musicians, our actors, or whatever I mentioned, we, we love that. They notice us. So I think this is something similar here. This, you have these writers who want the world to notice them. Jesus was such a big thing. Clearly, he must have made some kind of impact. And we have a bunch of other texts that are similar in that regard. Uh, I'll give you one example, the Epistles of Paul and Seneca. So whoever wrote this said, Paul, love Paul, a great thinker. Certainly, he must have known Seneca, who's the great Roman thinker, who is his contemporary. So he creates, the writer creates this exchange between Paul and Seneca, in which they mostly exchange pleasantries. You know, two great thinkers, but neither of them can actually say anything that's particularly uh, erudite. It's just like, oh, I love you, Paul. You're so great. I love you too, Seneca, blah, blah, blah. But the point is that Christianity has to make an impact. Paul has got to have gotten, got to have received the, the esteem that is his due from the people of his time. So that's what kind of this, uh, these little texts are doing something similar with. Yeah. Um, 
How did you first get interested in the, the Apophrica, and how did it become a, a focus of your scholarly work? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I grew up as Catholic. Uh, one might say I'm, uh, what's the word now? Recovering Catholic or something along those lines. Small C Catholic. My family didn't really go to church very much. Um, but my father was very much interested in uh, Christian history, Christian ideas, Who's Jesus? Blah blah blah, and also interested in apocalyptic ideas. The, I, you know, when I was, you know, in my early teens, this was during the time of the Cold War. My dad, uh, he's worked. He was a machinist, and there was someone at work who was a Jehovah's Witness, and he would always talk to this Jehovah's Witness about end time stuff. And occasionally, he'd bring home, um, is it Watchtower? Is that the name of their publication? So I would see this. And I also, uh, sorry, I don't, I'm trying to be careful not to get into too much nitty gritty, but I, I had a, I had a paper route, so I'd always read the newspaper even when I was a, a young lad, and the, the news, news was full of horrible um, warnings of nuclear war and so on. So I had this anxiety. So when I went to university, uh, I was, I was an English major, and the first religion class I took was a class on apocalypticism, and I learned in that class that all of these uh, these frightening things in the book of Revelation were really just a, a bunch of conventions that we find in lots of other Jewish and Christian apocalypses, as well as bits and pieces of tropes and such in non-Christian, non-Jewish works. So there's a certain code to these texts that I think that people in the ancient world would understand that we don't understand very well unless we, we you know, get deep into the, the, uh, the scholarship and, and the context. So I was introduced to two things, uh, biblical studies as an enterprise of, of trying to understand texts in their context and to texts that are not found in the Bible. And so I, I gravitated more towards religious studies. Uh, I graduated with a double major in English and religious studies, but when I went on to graduate work, it was in religious studies, biblical studies in particular. And I got more uh, 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 exposed to, to uh, apocryphal texts. And I took one class in... Uh, German IMA on magic and miracle. And I took a, I, I, I did a paper on the infancy gospel of Thomas. And this is uh, stories about Jesus from the age of five to 12 that kind of fits in nicely in, in, um, in that in between phase that where we hear nothing about Jesus in the New Testament. And he does uh, various miraculous things. And he also curses as well. He strikes people dead. So it's a fascinating little text for that. I did a paper on that. And my, my, my uh, instructor, my professor said, you know, if you're going to go on for your PhD, you should develop this further. And I thought, I, this is the, the thing that we really want to hear as a, as a student. It's like, you're good enough. And here's the project you should do. So that's what I ended up doing for my PhD. I, I did uh, a critical edition of... Uh, the Greek manuscripts for the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, many of which had not been published before, and did a whole bunch of, you know, uh, interpretations so of the text. And, and uh, the thesis one published, it's become now the standard work for for this text, which is you know, a really nice thing to have. And I've done some other work on Infancy Gospel of Thomas and now branched out into other texts, as we see here. Um, now, by training, I'm a New Testament scholar, and most of what I, most of my teaching is on Bible. But I do have a few classes on apocryphal texts as well. So a New Testament apocryphal class, a Gnosticism class. And I really try to uh, squeeze in apocrypha everywhere I go. So that even in my first year Bible class, the students will get exposed to some of these texts and hopefully want to take my other classes, but also get that broadening, that sense of, you know, there are other things out there that are of interest. And one other quick thing, when I was in uh, university also as an undergrad, um, I was involved in the student newspaper. And uh, there's no bigger, I think, um, topic of interest for someone who's in student journalism than issues of censorship, because the university doesn't want you to say certain things, and and you know the wider world is 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 uh, trying to restrict thought in various ways. So I I, I was got very interested in the idea of censorship and and the sense that the uh, various Christian churches don't want you to read certain things, and I touched on this earlier. So I was really interested in this idea. Um, now. Over time, I've cooled about that kind of thing. I understand why religions choose things as canon and dispense with other things. It's a natural kind of progression about what is standard and what's non-standard. Uh, though there are some religions that are a little bit 
easier going about such things that that uh, or even some Christian denominations that are easier going. That is one thing to say these are the best, uh, and it's another to say these are the only. And so, um, yeah, I'm less you know bothered by by the canonizing process, but uh, um, it is certainly a motivation for why I'm interested in this material. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think we're just about ready to wrap up, but uh, will the New Testament Apophagus series be continuing? Can we expect a volume four, maybe a five, a six, mm -hmm. a seven, eight, uh, you know, until the end of time? What's uh, <laughs> the, the, what's your feeling? Well, there are certainly lots more text, right, to, to, to cover. Um, the original contract for this series was two volumes, and at the end of volume two, the second volume was too big. So we had about 100 pages worth of stuff. And the publisher said, you know, if you take out these hundred pages, we'll give you a third volume, which is why volume three came out so soon after volume one. I mean, volume two, sorry, because I wanted to get, you know, these people had worked on this material. I wanted to get it out as soon as possible. So that means between the, the years between volume two and volume three, they, they, for me, they were pretty focused on getting this material done and getting it out. So I'm pretty tired <laughs> of being an editor. I, I, and I've edited other volumes too. So it feels like I don't have time to work on things on my own. So I want to, you know, let let this rest for a while. But it's hard not to like if I'm doing some other work and I see a text that hasn't really been published as well as it should be or never been translated. I think, oh, that could be for for the next volume. Um, and people will, uh, my colleagues will approach me saying, you know, is there going to be another one because I have this thing I can do? So there may be another one, or maybe I'll I'll mentor someone to take over and and, and do a fourth volume. We'll see. Um, uh, I certainly, I like collaborating, like working with other people, um, but it is nice to now be moving into something where I, I get to be my own, um, guy. <laughs> um, um, now also just make sure you viewers are aware that the academic society that I'm a part of the, uh, North American society for the study of Christian apocryphal literature, we have this, um, project called e -Clavis. A bit like the book I was showing earlier, which, um, yeah, thank you, <laughs> I see the link there, um, which is an open access source, which so anyone can look at it and use it, that, that lists as many apocryphal, apocryphal texts as we know of and provides a lot of information, summaries, manuscripts, manuscript images, bibliography, and so on. And so anyone uh, can access the material. And, and some of those texts, again, um, have appeared in our volumes, have appeared elsewhere, but some of them have not appeared anywhere else yet. So that's another resource that people go to for a text that they may have heard of, um, but don't know what to do with it or don't know how to learn more about it. And so that's that's a, an option to people to go to. So even when not working on these volumes, I am working on that project, and you know, my colleagues are, to, uh, to get the word out about these texts um, and get information in front of scholars who are interested in them. Very cool. So that's uh, TonyBurke.ca and uh, Nazcal, uh, N-A-S-S-C-A-L.com. And, and also, uh, you know, you can buy the book wherever uh, books can be purchased. We'll put a link uh, in the show notes. That said, if it's a little outside of your budget, tell your local library to buy a copy. Uh, and if you're a student, tell your uh, school library to buy a copy, and then tell your local library to buy a copy. So, uh, Dr. Burke, it's been really awesome speaking to you, and uh, thanks again. Bye. Thank you. See you.